the NRDC. You're listening to BostonFreeRadio.com. Hello and welcome to the show Words on Film. Words on Film is the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures and I am your host and movie critic Dan Burke. Just as a reminder, Words on Film is a show to which you are listening on Boston Free Radio and WBCA, watching on Somerville Community Access Television or some community access TV station that was kind enough to pick up this broadcast and to them I say thank you, or you're watching and listening to me on Facebook Live, either on my own personal page or on Boston Free Radio's Facebook page. Either way, you could join me i'm glad you could join me to discuss my favorite topic which is movies now usually i review five movies a show i try to make my minimum three i usually don't go go below three but this weekend uh basically a, a certain brand new movie took up about half the theaters in most of the multiplexes i visited so because of that i'm only reviewing four movies but then again four movies is more than some people see an entire weekend but in any event i've got four movies to review for you for this show but first i'm going to start things off with my segment what's topping the box office these are the top 10 highest grossing films of this past weekend and it should come as a surprise to absolutely no one that the number one movie at the box office is avengers infinity war which i'm guessing will probably be number one at the box office for at least another week maybe another two weeks but of course we will have to see but this weekend avengers infinity war cleaned up I didn't do all the math, but I can tell you that its weekend gross is more than all the other films this weekend in the top 10 combined. It grossed $257.7 million in the U.S. alone. That's just in one weekend. And it's on a budget of approximately 300 to 400 million dollars how much i don't exactly know i was just given a general estimate but around the world is doing even better having gross 640.5 million dollars so it's not technically a hit yet here in the states it's definitely a number one hit but it's it hasn't grossed all its money back yet but my guess is in a week's time and definitely by next weekend it most certainly will around the world it is already a tentative hit a quiet place was number one at the box office last week this week as predicted it fell to number two only making 11 million dollars now compare those two numbers avengers infinity infinity war made 257.7 million dollars the second place film made 11 million dollars that is crazy but don't feel bad for a quiet place because against a budget of 17 million dollars a quiet place has so far made 148.5 million dollars here in the states and and $235.4 million worldwide. So it goes without saying that A Quiet Place is a certified hit here in the States and around the world. I Feel Pretty, starring Amy Schumer, was number three at the box office when it debuted last week. This week, it's also number three, having made $8.2 million. Against a budget of $32 million, though, I Feel Pretty has so far grossed $29.6 million here in the States and $35 million around the world, making it not quite a hit yet here in the States, but around the world, it is a tentative hit so far. Rampage is another movie that's doing pretty well in its third week in release, although nothing compared to Avengers Infinity War, but I guess that is to be expected. Even though you have the star presence of Dwayne Johnson in Rampage, it doesn't compare to all the stars in Avengers Infinity War but more on that later. Rampage this weekend at number four at the box office slid from number two last week, having grossed $7.2 million at the U.S. box office this weekend. Against a budget of $120 million, Rampage has so far grossed $78 million here in the States and $335.1 million worldwide. So Rampage hasn't made all its money back here in the States, thereby not technically making it a hit here, but around the world it is already a certified hit by quite a bit. Black Panther actually did something pretty fascinating this past weekend. Last week, it was number eight at the box office. This weekend, it actually climbed to number five. This is significant because Black Panther is in its 11th week in release. And even though it's up against Avengers Infinity War, which stars many of the same characters, again, more on that later, Black Panther is still holding its own pretty well, even though it's been out for 
nearly three months. Black Panther earned $4.7 million in the U.S. box office this past weekend, but against a budget of $200 million, it has so far made $688.4 million here in the States and $1.334 billion worldwide. So it goes without saying that Black Panther is a certified hit. Super Troopers 2 is number 6 at the box office, falling from number 4 last week. Not a huge slide, but it made $3.7 million at the box office this past weekend. Against a budget of $13.5 million, Super Troopers 2 has so far made $22.2 million at the U.S. box office this weekend. Now, it is a tentative hit here in the States. I can't say how it is internationally, but here in the States, it's actually doing pretty well, despite the fact that it never went above number four at the box office. That's actually pretty impressive. Truth or Dare is number seven at the box office this weekend, having grossed $3.3 million this past weekend. Against a budget of just $3.5 million, meaning that Truth or Dare made nearly all its money back just this weekend alone. But against that budget pretty minuscule truth or dare has so far made 35.4 million dollars here in the states over 10 times its budget and 47.9 million dollars worldwide making it a certified hit here in the states and around the world Blockers is number 8 at the box office this weekend, having grossed just $3 million. But against a budget of $21 million, Blockers has so far made $53.2 million here in the States and $75.4 million worldwide, making it, again, a movie that, despite not going too far on the top 10, has made more than twice its budget in the states and around the world making it a certified hit here in the states and around the world ready player one is doing disappointingly all things considered it only made 2.6 million dollars the u.s box office against the budget of 175 million dollars ready player one has so far made 130.8 million dollars here in the states and 545.1 million dollars worldwide so even though ready player one is a certified hit around the world here in the states it's actually not a hit and that is is quite surprising and given the way Avengers Infinity War is is performing we may not see it in the top 10 by next week and that's too bad because it actually is a really good movie and finally number 10 at the box office is Traffic having made 1.7 million dollars this past weekend 180 over 111 and I had a stroke I couldn't speak I'd walk 150 over 90 and I had a stroke this is what high blood pressure sounds like. You might not feel its symptoms, but the results from a stroke are far from silent. Get back on your treatment plan or talk with your doctor to create a plan that works for you. Go to loweryourhpp.org. I had to tell everything's changed. Brought to you by the American Stroke Association, American Medical Association, and the Ad Council. Hey everybody, this is Sleaze Grinder, host of the Heavy Leather Topless Dance Party, the most dangerous show on television. And if your eyes are tired, guess what? Now you can listen to it. The Heavy Leather Topless Dance Party is now on Boston Free Radio Sundays at 7 p.m. Right here on Boston Free Radio. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. And as promised, my next movie that I'm going to be reviewing is the long-awaited Avengers Infinity War, which actually probably accomplished more than the original Avengers movie from 2012. This did the unthinkable and something that probably the DC Cinematic Universe, I shouldn't say probably, definitely, it definitely did something that the DC Cinematic Universe Universe only tried to do, and when they did it in the movie Justice League, it created a whimper, but not very much more than that. So Avengers Infinity War not only reunites many of the Avengers, including Iron Man, Captain America, Thor, Black Widow, uh, Scarlet Witch, and uh, se several other characters, but it also reunites, or rather unites, several other Marvel Cinematic Universe franchises into one film, including Black Panther, The Winter Soldier, Doctor Strange, and Guardians of the Galaxy. They are all together in this movie. And when I saw the movie advertised, I certainly appreciated the fact that many of the... Uh, 
the Marvel Cinematic Universe actors all came together to reprise their roles in this giant supergroup of a movie. But what I was afraid of was that it would be cameo overload. In other words, there would be too many characters in so little time. Well, amazingly, the the story had enough room or made enough room to accommodate all these characters. With that said, if you guys are expecting that the Avengers and all their compatriots are going to come out of this movie victorious, well, brace yourself. And again, One of the things I'm going to do during this review is not give away any spoilers. I will say, however, that it is a long, hard road for the Avengers and the other Marvel Cinematic Universe characters to take down Thanos. And In fact, let me just give you the plot right now. The Avengers and their allies must be willing to sacrifice all in an attempt to defeat the powerful Thanos before his blitz of devastation and ruin puts an end to the universe. So, a little bit of background on the character of Thanos. Thanos has basically made a number of cameos. He made a cameo at the end of the Avengers and also Avengers Age of Ultron, in addition to one brief cameo in the first Guardians of the Galaxy movie. Other than that, people who are not familiar with the comic book character might not know a lot about him. So here is a little bit of a background of Thanos. Thanos is a little bit more than a villain. He's probably a supervillain with godlike powers, and he is indeed a vengeful god. As a matter of fact, the Let me just give you a little bit of a a synopsis of Thanos. He was born on Saturn's moon Titan as the son of Eternal's mentor and Susan, and his brother is Eros of Titan. And mm, let me see if I can sum this up a little bit. Well, anyway, he is on a mission to go all around the universe and collect the Infinity Gems, and the reason he is doing this is to destroy much of the universe, including half of the Earth's population. I won't exactly give away what he does with this, but he is so intimidating a character, and he has enough vindictiveness in his blood that his rationale for wanting to rule the universe and get his own way with it is probably more reasonable than any super super supervillain in any film that's been made to date with similar motivations so again this is a very imposing villain and he's he's played by josh brolin although you wouldn't recognize him with the the cgi here it it says in the credits that josh brolin is playing thanos it's more like he's voicing him because thanos is more of a cgi character who i thought looked a lot like ron perlman but either way i thought josh brolin did extremely well playing thanos he's a he's a villain who you definitely hate for his motivations but you also like him for basically being such a badass villain although it is a long hard road for the avengers and their allies to take him down and it is not easy for them to do so i'm not going to give away what happens in the end but what i'm telling you is that it's not exactly a happy ending that's all i'm going to say about it i will say however that the avengers will be back And there will be more sequels in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, including one that is coming out this summer. It's actually Ant-Man vs. Wasp-Man. And Ant-Man is one of the members of the Avengers, along with Hawkeye, who's not in this film. But very much like Thor and the Incredible Hulk being absent from Captain America Civil War, you will eventually find out what they're up to and why they weren't in this mega movie. But I do have to say that in addition to the Avengers Infinity War having amazing special effects and great characters, most of whom we're familiar with from previous films, it balances all the characters, especially all the heroes in this movie, incredibly well. All of them are in different places at various times, depending on whom they meet. And all of them are fighting Thanos and his legion of followers in different places in different ways. 
So the Avengers Infinity War, I was afraid was going to be overload. I was I was pretty sure it wasn't going to be boring, and it certainly isn't. But it made all these characters interesting. I mean, certainly there's been room for character development in other films, and maybe Thanos probably didn't get the character developed in this movie that he might have deserved, but I could see Thanos being in another Marvel Cinematic Universe movie that's more of a prequel. I would love to see that, but if you're not familiar with Thanos, definitely look him up on Wikipedia or start reading the comic books, but Avengers Infinity War really impressed me. It certainly, in its 18th Marvel Cinematic Universe, it being the 18th Marvel Cinematic Universe movie, I expected it to actually show some signs of slowing down, but no, th- this movie certainly doesn't. Um, the Marvel Cinematic Universe is still going strong. I can't say which one is the, the best Marvel Cinematic Universe movie, but Avengers and Infinity War is up there, and it gets my rating of a knockout. Yeah, just about everyone in this film is is great. And it also ends unexpectedly. Come on, smile. Oh, honey, he's still not smiling. Maybe he's not a smiler. Yeah, maybe he's just not a happy baby. Maybe he's just being a boy. Or maybe he's teething. Maybe it's just a phase. Maybe he has autism, and we can definitely do something to help. Maybe is all you need to find out more about autism. No big, joyful smiles by six months is one early sign. Learn the others at AutismSpeaks.org slash signs. Brought to you by Autism Speaks and the Ad Council. Hey, 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 it's Genevieve, a.k.a. Miss Fab 617. And it's your girl, Crystal, a.k.a. The Crystal Lens. We're coming to you from our new show called Boston Come Through. We'll be bringing you the latest and greatest things happening in and around Boston. We'll be talking what? Black-owned businesses, social events, what? And the black experience. How's that sound, Genevieve? I love it. Dig it. Tune in every Wednesday at 9 p.m. Eastern Time on Boston Free Radio. Boston, come through. Come listen. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. The next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is Kings. This is a movie that didn't get as much of a release as Avengers Infinity War, and I actually had to go pretty far away from Boston to see this film, but I'm glad I did. It is a movie that takes place in 1992, and it's about the life of a foster family in South Central Los Angeles a few weeks before the city erupts in violence following the verdict of the Rodney King trial. So this foster family is mostly black, and it's run by a single mother by the name of Millie Dunbar, who's played by Halle Berry. Why Millie took it upon herself to take in so many foster children in her modest two-bedroom apartment i don't know the movie never elaborates upon why she does this and it doesn't really elaborate upon her her character either it just seems like this movie is very very much uh could have used some character development in just about all the characters i thought actually her one of her foster children one of her older foster children named Jesse Cooper in the movie, who's played by Lamar Johnson, was one of the standout actors in this film. And he is an actor who I don't actually remember from very many other films. I I thought he might have been a straight out of Compton, but that was just speculation. It turns out as I'm looking at his filmography right now, I'm wrong about that. He was in one show called The Next Step and a number of other smaller films that I didn't I haven't seen but I thought he was actually the standout person in this movie and certainly was uh, the moral compass in this film but anyway the, the movie also centers upon another person who lives near Millie and her family who is a white man by the name of Obi Hardison who's played in this movie by Daniel Craig and that's another um, th- thing I was wondering as I was watching this film In South Central L.A., it's mostly residents of color, but what is this white man doing in that neighborhood? Not that there's anything wrong with him living there, but at the same time, you don't exactly know why he's there. You don't know what he does for a living or if he does anything for a living. And you're also not even sure if Daniel Craig is playing an American because he has so few lines, and the lines he does 
actually say he says in a British accent. So as I was watching this film, I was thinking to myself, okay, if this guy is British, why did he come to America? Why did he settle in South Central L.A.? What is he doing in L.A.? What, what, did he have any hopes or aspirations? Which most people in South Central L.A., of course, they have aspirations, but they don't have the same kind of opportunities as people in Beverly Hills do. So I had a lot of questions about the characters, especially played by Daniel Craig and Halle Berry. But I did actually think that a movie which is set in 1992 in L.A. during the Rodney King riots makes for some compelling story. As a, as a matter of fact, I thought just about all the scenes which show this family making their way through Los Angeles during these, these chaotic riots were good and certainly had potential. What I didn't like about this film was how... Daniel Craig and Halle Berry's characters began to form a... Uh, that ba that basically a love story was forming between Daniel Craig and Halle Berry's characters. I didn't think that the love story was fitting for this film. And it seemed almost shoehorned in there. In fact, there's one scene where Halle Berry is actually dreaming about... Daniel Craig's character, and it looked like something more out of a, a modern dance uh, stage routine than the kind of movie that I think this could have been. So I was I was watching that scene in particular, and it seemed so out of place that it it really did take me out of the movie. Also, there's some uneven storytelling. The movie doesn't really tend. The, the movie tends to eh, focus a little bit too much on some characters like Millie and Obi, again, Halle Berry and Daniel Craig's characters, more than other characters that I think could have benefited more from a little bit more narrative focus. Also, while I do like Halle Berry and I think she's a good actress, I did think she was miscast for this role because she's... A single mother raising these foster kids out of the goodness of her own heart, which is admirable, but she doesn't exactly look like she is stressed out or afraid from raising all these kids. I would have thought that another actress, maybe like Octavia Spencer or Jennifer Hudson, would have been a better choice for this role, but th that's just... That's just my opinion. Of course, this, this whole show is my opinion. So it's worth it to note that the writer and director of this film is Denise Ga Gamzi Erguven, who is a Turkish director who I... Oh, actually, she directed one film that I saw, which was nominated for Best uh, Foreign Language Film at the Oscars. That one was called Mustang. And that one was, was pretty good, but I just thought this one... Oh, uh, correction, that is actually, it was nominated for a number of awards at Cannes, but I don't think it was nominated for any Oscars. It was nominated for a slew of awards, but I, I stand corrected on saying that she was nominated for an Oscar. She probably came very close with the movie Mustang, but yeah, I, I just didn't think Kings was the best directorial debut for her. Either, th either that or, I don't know what, what, persuaded someone who was born and raised in Turkey to write a film that takes place in Los Angeles at a specific point in time in which she wasn't actually in L.A. I'm not saying that it's necessarily a requirement to have been born and raised in L.A. to write a story about the, the Rodney King riots, but it helps to have actually remembered that. I remember the Rodney King riots extremely well, and I was only nine years old. And plus, I I was born and raised in the United States, so I felt like this story would have worked better maybe from an American director than one from Turkey. But all things considered, I did think the acting was good. I, I just didn't think the story was particularly even. They tried to shoehorn a romantic comedy into this movie, and it just didn't work. So... Kings gets my rating of a strikeout, which is really too bad. Adopt US Kids presents Multiple Choice Parenting. You've messed up your daughter's haircut. Do you A, get spiritual? Mom, where's the mirror? Beauty is within. 
Oh. B. Find the positives. Less time blow drying, more time texting. Or C. Show empathy. Mom, you really don't have twinsies. I kind of love it. You don't have to be perfect to be a perfect parent. Thousands of teens in foster care will love you just the same. For more information on adoption, visit AdoptUSKids.org. A message from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, Adopt US Kids, and the Ad Council. Diane Wong here announcing a new radio program. Let's talk about race. From our beginnings as a white supremacist society to our current existence as a white supremacist society, race is a topic that affects us all, and yet we have difficulty talking about it. Why is race so difficult? Why can't we talk openly about white supremacy? Why don't we like to talk about white privilege? Why is internalized oppression shrouded in mystery? What about lynching? What about gerrymandering and the current Black Lives Matters debate? We'll talk about all of it. Come and join us Thursdays from 7 to 8 p.m. Let's talk about race. Boston Free Radio. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. The next movie I'm reviewing is a Netflix original, which means you can find it on Netflix right now. It actually came out on April 27th, and it's called The Week Of. The Week Of stars Adam Sandler and Chris Rock, and this is Adam Sandler's fifth film that has been released exclusively to Netflix. So... The question you're probably asking yourselves if you haven't seen the week of is, is it funny? Especially given that Adam Sandler's in it. And unfortunately, I have to say that it isn't. It's a slight improvement over other films he's done, particularly films as as sexist and as homophobic as I now pronounce you Chuck and Larry or That's My Boy or The Do-Over. But the week of, even though it's... Adam Sandler's toned down the mean humor, it still doesn't mean that it's particularly funny. And I'm going to tell you exactly why it wasn't funny. So the week of takes place during the week leading up to a wedding. The wedding of Adam Sandler's daughter, or Adam Sandler's character's daughter, and Chris Rock's character's son. So yeah, there's an interracial marriage going on here, which is it's good to see, but that's about the only thing to commend this movie on. But the movie centers on two fathers with opposing personalities who come together to celebrate the wedding of their children. They are forced to spend the longest weekend of their lo- excuse me, the longest week of their lives together, and the big day cannot come soon enough. That's the tagline of it. It's also worth noting that this is directed by Robert Smigel, who was a who is a former writer of Saturday Night Live, and this is him making his directorial debut. Now, Robert Smigel is a very funny guy. He always has been. In fact, not only are his SNL sketches usually very good, but he also did those fantastic uh, cartoons for the SNL segment Saturday TV's Funhouse, which unfortunately they don't do that anymore, but even when SNL was in a rut and it sucked, the TV's Funhouse sketches were usually really funny. So this movie isn't all that great, but it's not entirely Robert Smigel's fault. The fault is that there's a lot going on in this movie. There are way too many characters and there's not enough time dedicated to actually developing these characters. Granted, Adam Sandler and Chris Rock's characters are the most developed. Adam Sandler plays a lower middle class independent contractor who's struggling to pay for his daughter's wedding and also settling for a low rent hotel in which to have his daughter's wedding at. And Chris Rock plays a surgeon who is a bit estranged from his son in that he is divorced from his son's mother and doesn't live or hasn't lived with his son for years and doesn't quite know his children as well as he thought but he also has the financial means to pay for this wedding but Adam Sandler's character being as stubborn as he is won't hear anything of it so unlike the the tagline that I just read it's not exactly about two fathers being at odds with one another. It's more about their chaotic families, especially because of the fact that Adam Sandler's character insists that the members of both families actually stay at his 
two be- uh, decker house, or rather two floor house, a- and of course hilarity ensues and i say that lightly because there are so many people in that house and so little room for all of them but the reason they're staying at the house is not only because of adam sandler's character's insistence it also it also is because the hotel where the festivities were going to be held had a number of well structural malfunctions particularly leaks in the ceiling and there is a running gag where the owner of this hotel is this middle eastern man who despite all the chaos keeps smiling and laughing and it's not particularly funny when this middle eastern character smiles and laughs the first time at all this chaos and it's not particularly amusing when he does it the last time either even when adam sandler is screaming at him my god why are you laughing and i almost thought that i i didn't exactly know why there was a middle eastern guy in this role of the hotel manager who does his best and just keeps laughing during uh, leaks in the ceiling i i I wasn't sure if that was adam sandler making a statement about middle eastern people and the fact that they can't run successful businesses here in the states and i also took issue with the portrayal of long island in this movie i've said before in movies in which Adam Sandler is starred that take place in New England. Movies like That's My Boy, most particularly. That's the only one that comes to mind. Adam Sandler has a bad habit of making New Englanders, especially people from Boston, look bad. You know, they're either corrupt or stupid or, you know, they hump every anything that walks. And if you don't believe me, watch That's My Boy. And I had a theory back when I saw That's My Boy that Adam Sandler hates New England. Well, here in this movie, he makes Long Island look like a dump. And I, I would imagine that anybody who's from Long Island might be offended by this movie. They might find some poignancy in the way it's the the way it's portrayed but i highly doubt it i don't think long island is as bad as this movie makes it out to be and i just saw this as adam sandler being in new york and la kind of thumbing his nose at working class people despite playing a working class person in this movie himself so the week of is a disappointment i wouldn't give it my rating of a flunk out because it is much better than the do-over or that's my boy or any of the other really, really disappointing films that Adam Sandler's made recently. Unfortunately, even though it's not as offensive, it's still not particularly funny. And I, it seems that when Adam Adam Sandler's in a comedy with with the involvement of other funny people like Adam, excuse me, like Chris Rock or like Robert Smigel, he seems to drag them down with them because Chris Rock isn't particularly funny in this movie either. It's a disappointment. So The Week Of gets my rating of a strikeout. It is a movie that really doesn't find its footing and has presumably smart people doing dumb things. And that never equals a funny movie. Dad, this is fun. I didn't think I liked kayaking. Well, I'm glad you enjoyed it. But I think it's time to head back in. Okay. Can we come back? Sure. Hey, be careful getting out of the boat. It's a kayak, Dad. <laughs> I'm going to return the kayak. Can we walk home? How about a taxi? It's a short fare from your neighborhood to your naturehood. Visit discovertheforest.org to find a neighborhood park or green space near you. Brought to you by the Ad Council and the U.S. Forest Service. It's all about free speech, baby. Radio your way. BostonFreeRadio.com you all to tune into my music radio show voices of time heard live each and every wednesday from 3 to 5 p.m eastern time on boston free radio at bostonfreeradio.com voices of time while founded on the golden age of music from the 60s and 70s in all its permutations also visits other eras in many genres we feature rock and roll from its original era and beyond rock in all its variations including prog psychedelia garage and punk motown old school r&b soul, 
blues, jazz, gospel, folk, old school country, zydeco, all music New Orleans, rockabilly, bluegrass, world music, comedy, poetry, and spoken word, and much more. Please come and join me for an adventurous two-hour ride into the stratosphere of sound where the voices of time reverberate for all eternity. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. The next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is Lean on Pete. This is an independent film, which was technically released in 2017, and it's a British drama film directed by Andrew High, who is a native of North Yorkshire, England, and his some of his movies, uh, previous films, include a number of films that I haven't seen, but you might have. He did one uh, a couple of years... Oh, actually, I did see this one. There's one he did, which actually he directed the star... Um, Charlotte Rampling to an Academy Award nomination. That movie was 45 years. He also did another film in 2011 called Weekend, which I haven't seen, but stars Tom Cullen and Chris New. But despite being British, Lean on Pete takes place in the Pacific Northwest, and it's about a young boy who's about 16, whose name is Charlie, who's played by Charlie Plummer. And Charlie Plummer, you might remember from the film All the Money in the World, which starred Christopher Plummer. Now, despite the fact that Christopher Plummer plays the grandfather of Charlie Plummer's character. Christopher Plummer and Charlie Plummer are actually not related. Their names are spelled the exact same way, but are they actually grandfather and grandson in real life? Surprisingly, no. But either way, Charlie Plummer has some really good acting chops. I thought he was very good in All the Money in the World. But here he plays a teen living with a single father who finds work caring for an aging racehorse whose name is Lean on Pete. Let me say that again. The racehorse's name is Lean on Pete. You find out the name of this this horse, but you don't know exactly how... Lean on Pete got his name, why he wasn't just called Pete. Maybe it says so in the novel upon which this movie is based, which is written by Willie Vlaughton, but the when Charlie cares for this eight uh, this racehorse, he is under at first the guidance of a a farmhand whose name is Del Montgomery, who's played by Steve Buscemi. And this the racetrack movie or the racetrack parts of this movie take place outside of Portland, Oregon, yet Steve Buscemi doesn't seem like a native of Portland. Uh l- let me see actually he's he's of course a native of Brooklyn, New York, and in this movie he plays a guy who's been working on racetracks and farms his entire life, yet he has a very heavy Brooklyn accent. Go figure. And it turns out one of his race hands is actually a girl named Bonnie, played by Chloe Sevigny, who is actually a native of Springfield, Massachusetts. But Chloe Sevigny actually passes more like a native of the Pacific Northwest than Steve Buscemi does. But either way, Steve Buscemi is actually funny in this film. And I do have to say that Lean on Pete is a movie that's rated R. It's rated R for language, and most of that language comes from Steve Buscemi. When you think about a movie that is about a 16-year-old who takes care of a rejected racehorse, you might think kids' film. And otherwise, if Steve Buscemi and in some scenes Charlie Plummer had actually cleaned up his language, maybe this would have worked, but or worked as a kids' film. But no, I guess they were just kind of uncompromising and didn't pull any punches with the with the dialogue in this film. So, Lean on Pete is R, but rest assured it's rated R for language, not for violence and not for sexuality. So, I think people who are 13 years or older might be okay with seeing this film, but again, I do think if they had cleaned up the language, it could have been more accessible to children as well but in any event charlie lives with a single father and then finds himself rescuing lean on pete when 
He learns that Pete is bound for a slaughter, and the two embark on an odyssey across the new America frontier in search of not only a new place to call home, but also a long-lost aunt of Charlie who he's trying to find. And he's only, he doesn't even have a cell phone in which to find his aunt. As a matter of fact, this movie doesn't exactly give you a, a time or a, or a, I was it certainly gives you a place it takes place for, from Oregon to Wyoming but other than that it could take place present day but then again n- nobody uses a computer in this film there is one person who works on the w- racetrack who laments about how kids just want to stare at computers these days but also nobody owns or uses a cell phone in this film to my knowledge and if they did i think the the search for charlie's aunt would have been a lot less consequential he probably could have just googled her name and then automatically found her or probably would have done a little bit more digging than that but here charlie uses a payphone uh the various payphones around the the area he he's at but the the real story takes place when lean on pete and charlie escape from the racetrack in portland and embark on an adventure from portland to wyoming and that's one of the more fascinating parts of the film especially when charlie is literally starving in the desert those are hard scenes to watch they're not traumatizing but it's hard to see somebody starving and when I'm sitting in the theater with my popcorn in hand, I even feel that that starvation that Charlie's experiencing. So this, is, this has several great performances from Charlie Plummer, also from Chloe Sevigny and Steve Buscemi, despite not being especially convincing as somebody who was born and raised in the Pacific Northwest. There's also a very brief but impactful performance here by steve zahn and to say what steve zahn's character is or how he gets in contact with the the character of charlie is going to ruin part of the film but steve zahn appears he's certainly one of the more familiar faces in this film and his performance leaves an impact but certainly charlie Plummer anchors this film extremely well for his first starring role I think Charlie Plummer does an amazing job. Lean on Pete is certainly an accessible story to several people, even if if it's rated R when it should have been rated PG or PG-13. And it gets my rating of a knockout. I certainly felt for the Charlie character, especially given the heartache he goes through. And, of course, I felt bad for the horse as well during certain scenes. I won't give away what happens to either of them, but it is a very compelling film. Certainly hard to watch in some instances, but it's enjoyable. Hope you enjoyed your meal. And I just want to say, he's lucky to have a brother like you. Lucky? Caring for my brother is far from easy. But he's a part of me, like my arms and legs, so I'll be his. No time for tired. Nothing can disable this love. He needs me, but I'm the lucky one, even though I need help now and then. If you're caring for a loved one, visit aarp.org caregiving for care guides and community. Support for your strength. Brought to you by AARP and the Ad Council. I love those real six sides. They're the ones that move me. A thinly blow. <laughs> Neurotic tone. <laughs> Intensify and groove me. This and more on Unpackerties, Saturdays at noon on Boston Free Radio. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. And now that I've reviewed all the movies that I'm going to review for you for the show, it's now time for me to get into a segment I usually get into when I run out of films to review. And that's going through a number of the DVD releases that are coming out on May 1st. And the big one that's coming out is Peter Rabbit. Of course, that came out in theaters a little while ago. It was a it was a pretty big box office hit, all things considered, and especially did well during the Easter season. But 
May is a little bit of an awkward time for Peter Rabbit to come out on DVD, but especially considering that you you associate rabbits with Easter, and Easter ended a month ago. But it, it's still a good film to watch. I, I certainly liked it. One thing I didn't I didn't think it was as good as Paddington Two. And I didn't like how they remade Peter Rabbit from being what Beatrix, Beatrix Potter wrote him as. In, in other words, a, a slightly mischievous but mostly unassuming rabbit into, in this movie, a little bit of taking up the characteristics of Bugs Bunny. I, I didn't think that was particularly appropriate for the Peter Rabbit character, but I did think that James Corden did well as, as the voice of Peter Rabbit, d- despite that that characteristic that irked me. And I also thought the live action characters in this film played by Domhnall Gleeson as the McGregor who takes over Mr. McGregor's farm after Mr. McGregor, who's played very briefly in this film by Sam Neill, passes away. I also absolutely loved Rose Byrne in Peter Rabbit. So there are, I, I think when I reviewed Peter Rabbit, I gave it my rating of a checkout, and I still stand by that. I certainly thought that the animation was really good, the live action acting was, was great. I also really liked Flopsy, Mopsy, and Cottontail, who were voiced by Margot Robbie, Daisy Ridley, and one other actress I can't remember. She's British, but uh, the, the third actress, but... I, Peter Rabbit is out on DVD and Blu-ray today. It's probably out on streaming, too, but I don't know what platforms. But definitely check that movie out if you haven't gotten the chance. The other movie that's coming out, or another movie that's coming out on Blu-ray and DVD, is 12 Strong. This is the one with Chris Hemsworth, who plays one of the first platoon members who enters Afghanistan right after 9-11. This is the previously top secret operation where a certain army platoon goes into Afghanistan on horseback and fights the Taliban. This was something that was top secret until a couple of years ago, and of course, the minute it was declassified, the film rights were sold. And I did think that Chris Hemsworth made a pretty good leading man, but I did think that despite the strength of this true story material, I was surprised at how forgettable 12 strong actually was i did think that when the movie covered 9 11 happening the characters didn't look especially surprised they looked angry and ready to fight the taliban but again it it was almost as if they were waiting for the planes to hit the twin towers on cue in addition to that there were also some war movie cliches about one guy who's about to leave the armed services but then re-enrolls after the the twin towers are hit and the pentagon for that matter and there's another guy who's about to retire but then he goes back in seen that in so many other war films before did this happen in real life for, for this real story of 12 strong it might have but somehow i doubt it it's a hollywood movie cliche i think i gave 12 strong my rating of a check out but certainly not a knockout and i didn't hate it so much to give it a flunk out or a strikeout i think it was my checkout review so it's on dvd or blu-ray if you're interested another movie that's coming out in theaters right now or rather not coming out in theaters coming out on dvd and blu-ray is winchester a movie i actually did see in theaters when it was released back in january and This movie stars Helen Mirren, and it actually has a very creepy poster of Helen Mirren in black clothing, almost as if she's going to a funeral. She has uh, uh, one of those draperies over her head. I don't know what it's called. I want to call it a shawl, but again, this is a movie where Jason Clarke plays a guy who follows... Sarah Winchester as she is haunted by spirits inside her San Jose mansion in 1906. And this movie feels fictional, even though it's based on a true story. I think I gave this movie my rating of a strikeout, because I did think the the story behind the Winchester mansion was fascinating, but a lot of it didn't really make very much sense. It seemed like the story, the conflict was resolved by the end, but then there's that epilogue saying that the Winchester mansion is still haunted. Again, you can't go wrong most times with 
with Helen Mirren in a movie. And Jason Clark has continually impressed me in movies he's been in, especially his most recent Chappaquiddick. But Winchester is a subpar horror film, which is probably why it was released in January of this year. And there's another film that's coming out on DVD and Blu-ray, maybe streaming, don't quote me on this, but this is a movie I actually missed. It's an animated film which came out in Japan, and it was released by Studio Ghibli, and it's called Mary and the Witch's Flower, and it's directed by Hiromasa Yonibayashi. And this is a guy, he's a young guy, he's only 44 years old, or comparatively young. He actually has directed a number of films, including When Marnie Was There, which was actually nominated for Best Feature-Length Animated Film. He also directed The Secret World of Arietti, and he definitely invites a lot of comparisons between himself and Ayo Miyazaki, but he looks to be the next Ayo Miyazaki. But that being said, I have not seen Mary and the Witch's Flower, but that's a movie I might actually see and review for you for next week. And just very briefly, because it's my break is coming up soon. Another movie that's coming out on DVD and Blu-ray is one called The Insult. And this is a movie that comes out of Iran, and it is based on... It's, it's not based on a true story, but it is actually... Oh, it's, I'm sorry. It's not, it's not out of Iran. It's out of Lebanon. It was nominated for Best Foreign Language Film. I highly recommend this one. This one, even though it didn't win Best Foreign Language Film, it's certainly a film that makes you think, particularly about uh, conflicts and the resolution of them. I know that's not a lot to say, but I'm out. I'm probably okay to have one more drink before I drive home. <sighs> Okay, I open the window to stay alert. Probably okay, I just popped some gum in my mouth. Step out of the car, please. I probably made a mistake. Probably okay isn't okay when it comes to drinking and driving. If you see a warning sign, stop and call a cab, a car, or a friend. Buzz driving is drunk driving. A message brought to you by NHTSA and the Ad Council. Every Tuesday at 3, something special happens on Boston Free Radio. Why, it's Toppers with your host, Gil. Toppers, spinning the tunes that today's youth demand. From Justin Bieber to Lady Gaga to the Fleetwoods. And, on occasion, Hoagie Carmichael. If you missed the program, you can check out the archives at Toppers Radio. That's one word, dot blogspot, dot C-O-M. Toppers. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. Just as a reminder, you are listening to Words on Film on Boston Free Radio and WBCA, watching and listening to Words on Film on Somerville Community Access TV or some community access television station that was kind enough to pick up this broadcast. And to them, I say thank you as always. Or you are watching and listening to me on Facebook Live on my own personal page this time. Either way, you could join me. I'm glad you could join me to discuss my favorite topic, which is movies. And just a correction before I continue with my segment, what's to- oh, excuse me, what's coming out next? The the article of women's clothing that Helen Mirren was wearing on the the DVD and poster uh, of Winchester is a veil. <laughs> Thank you to Kathy Lauder of of um, Nashville, Tennessee, for making that correction for me. As, as I'm speaking a mile a minute, I sometimes forget basic nouns, but thank you so much, and I do apologize for the error. So now on to my segment, what's coming out next? These are the big films, unless otherwise stated, that are coming out in theaters this coming weekend. Now, my prediction is that Avengers Infinity War will be number one at the box office next weekend. I can't say what it's going to be the weekend after, but it's definitely going to be number one this weekend. So, these films have some has have one very tough act to follow. The biggest film, arguably, that's coming out this coming weekend is Overboard. This is a remake of the movie of the same name, starring Goldie Hawn and Kurt Russell. This time, the stars are 
are Anna Ferris and Eugenio Derbez. Eugenio Derbez is probably familiar to, well, undoubtedly to many Spanish-speaking audiences, but he was in one of the biggest Mexican films of all time, Instructions Not Included, which is a movie he also produced, and he made his debut statewide with the film How to Be a Latin Lover, which was eh, adequate. It just had a very icky storyline but again i i'll explain about that later i only have a few minutes but overboard is the story of a spoiled wealthy yacht owner owner excuse me who is thrown overboard and becomes the target of revenge from his mistreated employee again this is a remake of the 1987 movie that also co-stars john Hanna and ava longoria so i have not seen the original overboard i know of it but i have haven't actually seen it i might see that film before i see the remake but i can't guarantee i'm going to see overboard but if i do you'll hear my review of it next week the next movie the other movie that's coming out in theaters this coming weekend is another highly anticipated one called tully and Tully stars Charlize Theron. It's also directed by Jason Reitman, and its screenplay was written by Diablo Cody. So what do Jason Reitman, Diablo Cody, and Charlize Theron have in common? Well, they were all involved in another film, which was called Young Adult. And Young Adult also starred Charlize Theron. It was nominated for one Golden Globe for Best Actress. I don't know if this is a sequel to Young Adult, but let's see. The film, or the, here's the Here's the synopsis. The film is about Mario, okay, oh, excuse me, Marlo, a mother of three, including a newborn. Okay, so it's not a sequel to Young Adult, because that was not the Charlize Theron's character's name in Young Adult. But anyway, the film is about Marlo, played by Charlize Theron, a mother of three, including a newborn, who is gifted a night nanny by her brother. Hesitant to the extravagance at first, Marlo comes to form a unique bond with a thoughtful, surprising, and sometimes challenging young nanny named Tully. And the movie co-stars Mackenzie Davis, Mark Duplass, and Ron Livingston. And the, the, the young nanny is, of course, played by Mackenzie Davis, who hasn't, been in, hasn't starred in anything recently, but she's co-starred in a number of notable films, including The Martian, starring Matt Damon, and last year's Blade Runner 2049, which was criminally underrated. And, uh, yeah, Mackenzie Davis is one of those actresses to watch, and I will certainly be watching this film, and I'll let you know exactly what I think about it come next week when I review it for you. And just briefly, another film that's coming out, probably in limited release, is one called The Desert Bride. This one stars Paulina Garcia and Claudio Risi. And this movie is live action and animation. So it tells the story of Teresa, a 54-year-old woman who works as a domestic employee in a family home in Buenos Aires. For decades, he has taken refuge in the routine of his task, but now the family has decided to sell the house. His life begins to totter. I don't know where there's room for animation in this one, but if this movie's out in theaters, I'll try to catch it, and I'll let you know what I think by next week. But that just does, blah, blah, that just about does it with Words on Film. Words on Film being the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures, and I am, of course, your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. The views and opinions expressed on this show are solely my own, and they do not necessarily reflect the views and opinions of any employees working at the station which is airing this broadcast or the station as a whole. So thank you for tuning in to discuss my favorite topic, which is movies, and this is Dan Burke saying I'll see you at the movies.